Hello, everyone. This is an important time, uh, and it requires important measures. Uh, that's why Canada's Canadians have been stepping up here at COP26. It's a milestone. This is when we met in Paris. We're facing big challenges as communities, as countries, and as a world. It's time for some big solutions. We laid out plans to get to net zero by 2050 at home. We've made progress with partners to keep 1.5 alive. It's a goal we need to reach. Chez nous, on a mis un prix sur la pollution qu'on a défendu devant la Cour suprême et même euh, créé un consensus parmi les Canadiens. Il faut avancer sur euh, euh, la tarification du carbone. On a amené des investissements en record dans le transport collectif, dans les énergies propres. On a fait énormément en partenariat avec les peuples autochtones, les partenaires à travers le pays comme les provinces pour protéger nos océans, protéger euh, nos, euh, nos terres et notre biodiversité. We're going to keep moving forward at home. On emissions, we've committed to put a cap and begin to cut emissions from oil and gas production. We're the first major oil and gas producing nation to do that. We're committed to reduce methane emissions by at least 30% by 2030. And in particular, reduce oil and gas methane emissions by 75% by 2030. On electricity, we're committed to phasing out coal-fired fire electricity by 2030. We're going to ensure that all new vehicle sales are zero emission vehicles and that we have a net zero grid by 2035. This is something we've said a number of times. And people have remarked on here at, at COP that we're not just saying we need to move forward as a world, we ought to do things. Canada is showing that we are doing things. Uh, we're making big decisions at home and encouraging people around the world to do more as well. Because climate change doesn't recognize borders. The COP has spoken to dozens and dozens of leaders, driving ambition, deepening cooperation. Today, with partners like the IMF, World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, we're calling to bringing in carbon pricing to triple it on emissions up from about 21% of emissions covered by a price on pollution around the world to get to 60% covered by a price on pollution by 2030. We're working with Germany and other partners on reaching that $100 billion a year commitment that was made at Paris that is as yet unfulfilled. We're getting close, there's still more work to do that Stephen and others are going to keep pushing on over the coming days. Notre planète est à un moment critique. Le progrès des derniers jours qu'on a vu au G20, qu'on a vu ici à Cap avec des engagements par différents chefs de gouvernement, c'est un bon début, mais ce n'est qu'un début. Les gens à travers la planète nous regardent, les travailleurs, le peuple autochtone, les gens sont en train d'exiger encore plus de leadership des dirigeants de la planète les pays d'un bout à l'autre de ce monde. Et c'est exactement ce sur quoi le Canada se concentre. Notre avenir et celui de nos enfants est en jeu. We've been the past five days extremely busy for our Canadian delegation. From uh, our first stop in the Netherlands, where we talked about trade, shared values, and the work we need to continue to do with strong allies on multilateralism promoting democracy, the G20 in Italy, where we brought the world together to recognize 1.5 as a target to commit to reaching net zero by the middle of the century. These are things that we're going to have to continue to push on. We're involved uh, working on vaccines, global supply chains, economic growth, strengthening our support people who are struggling with affordability at the same time as we show leadership on the big issues that the world is facing. So from climate action, to vaccines, to progressive trade, we focused on what matters to Canadians. Clean air and good jobs, beating COVID-19, doing our part to build a stronger, healthier
healthier world. It's been a busy number of days, but Canada has been there to do the hard work and to continue doing the hard work over the coming days to build a better future, not just for Canadians, but for everyone. The travail que nous devons faire, c'est le travail que nous allons faire. Merci. Madame Ministre, on va commencer à parler de questions pour Valérie. Une question en suivi. One question, one follow-up. Starting with David. Are you shooting videos? Are you shooting videos? Hi there, Prime Minister. I wanted to touch on your session this morning on pushing for a global minimum price on carbon. You had like-minded allies there from Europe, multilateral organizations who are clearly supportive of this, but missing biggest traded partner, biggest economy, the United States, a national carbon pricing plan is not part of what Joe Biden is proposing. So, how big of an obstacle? Is that to achieving this goal? I think we all recognize that the biggest obstacle is figuring out how we're all going to live up to our commitments to arrive at net zero emissions by 2050. How we're going to meet our 2030 targets. And we know there are many different approaches that uh, every country is going to have to take to reduce emissions decarbonize their economy to get to net zero. And carbon pricing is one of the most effective and cheapest ways to get there. Economists know uh, that it's one of the most efficient ways of doing it. It's an extremely powerful tool that incentivizes businesses and consumers to make smarter choices. Making sure that pollution isn't free anywhere it's a very smart and powerful idea. Now, countries are beginning to see that what we've done in Canada and what has been done elsewhere is extremely powerful for reducing emissions. And we're excited uh, about the interest that uh, international organizations and uh, other countries are looking at what we've done with. So there's lots of work to do, but the important thing is reducing those emissions, and I am very optimistic that as people look at the hard work of reducing emissions, they'll realize that not putting a price on pollution in their jurisdictions is going to mean having to do more, more expensively, in more complex ways in other parts of their economy, and that's what's so appealing about carbon pricing. Uh, Je pense que le grand défi auquel on fait face, c'est de réduire les émissions jusqu'à la carboneutralité en 2050. Et évidemment, il y a différents moyens, différents outils qu'on peut utiliser. Mais on sait aussi qu'un des outils les plus puissants pour le faire, le plus efficace pour le faire, c'est de mettre un prix sur la pollution, de s'assurer que de polluer n'est plus gratuit nulle part. Alors, les différents pays vont prendre leurs propres décisions sur comment ils vont et quels outils, outils ils vont utiliser. Mais nous, on est là pour démontrer que ça se fait, ça se fait de façon directe qui aide les gens et qui va fonctionner pour limiter les émissions. Mais je sais qu'il y a bien des, des, des pays euh, qui vont être très intéressés par l'exemple, le leadership du Canada et d'autres pays qui sont déjà allés de l'avant avec euh, la tarification du carbone. But Prime Minister, between the G20 and here, we've seen some of the other big economies, China, Russia, India, either holding out or not showing up on, on a lot of the initiatives you're trying to make progress on. The Americans are here, they're engaged. I mean, do you think you can convince America to move towards a full carbon pricing regime in all 50 states? What I'm pointing out is that we have a extremely powerful tool that is straightforward, that everyone can understand put a price on pollution to make sure that polluting isn't free and consumers and businesses have the predictability to be able to make choices and investments that will reduce our emissions. There are lots of different tools that can be used and every country will pick their options but what we can do is show that it's powerful, it's straightforward and it's impactful. Uh, to do that, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Look, a few years ago, uh, nobody would have even imagined that we could set a global minimum corporate tax. And suddenly we have. These are things that are the right ideas that when their time has come, people start to adopt, and that's what we're going to be pushing very hard around the world on. Bonjour, Madame Ministre. Uh, 
Monsieur Trudeau, Madeleine Trémorin, Radio-Canada. Vous avez vanté ce matin le modèle, justement, de la taxe sur le carbone, de redonner de l'argent dans le portefeuille des Canadiens, mais ce n'est pas un modèle qui est en vigueur partout au pays. Donc, à mesure que le prix va augmenter, vous parlez de 170 la tonne en 2030, est-ce que ça va devenir plus difficile de ne pas avoir un modèle uniforme au pays? Je pense que ce qui compte le plus, c'est l'impact. On sait très bien qu'il y a différentes façons de mettre un prix sur la pollution. Il y a des bourses de carbone, il y a la tarification directe. L'important, c'est de s'assurer que ce n'est plus gratuit de polluer et de s'assurer que c'est un système équivalent. Les, les différents systèmes sont équivalents les uns aux autres à travers le pays et éventuellement à travers le monde. On sait très bien que euh, tous les pays ne vont pas avoir exactement la même approche. On n'a pas tous les mêmes économies, les mêmes défis. Mais si on peut se mettre d'accord sur des standards, sur un impact semblable, comme on a pu faire au Canada, où différentes provinces ont des différentes façons de faire, mais on peut s'assurer que l'équivalence est là. Euh, et nous allons continuer de, de travailler pour s'assurer que l'impact de cette, euh, ce, ce prix sur la pollution est pareil à travers le pays. Après les 48 heures que vous avez passées, puis après le sommet du G20, quel est votre niveau de confiance que le 1,5 degré, c'est encore possible de le respecter, cet objectif? Je sais que c'est encore possible. Mais je sais aussi que ça va exiger pas juste tout le travail qu'on est en train de faire, mais ça va exiger encore plus de travail. C'est pour ça que nous, comme pays, mais d'autres aussi, sont en train de se pousser les uns les autres pour en faire plus. La COP26, c'est un moment extrêmement important, mais c'est un moment, un milestone parmi euh, tant d'autres. Nous allons devoir être ambitieux ici, et l'année prochaine, nous allons continuer d'avoir besoin d'être ambitieux et de continuer à en faire plus pour atteindre ce 1.5 qui est si nécessaire. Et And one of the things we recognize uh, is that we're going to need to be continuing to push our levels of ambition. What uh, we're doing by pushing hard now and pushing on the development of new solutions and technologies, of, uh, new ways of growing our economy, of decarbonizing, is going to allow us to continue to be even more ambitious. What we decide right here is going to be important, but as we continue to push and be even more ambitious as we support uh, people with good jobs in our communities and around the world, as we support the developing world with the need uh, to reduce uh, emissions and provide energy for their citizens in ways that don't uh, contribute to accelerated greenhouse uh, uh, climate change. These are the things we need to do. So yes, I am confident we're going to be able to stay on that track to one for 1.5 because I am confident we are going to continue to keep pushing ourselves and each other to be more and more ambitious. Yeah. Uh, the, the President of the European Commission talked about border carbon adjustments that they're planning to do. Just curious, uh, you know, preventing carbon leakage or sort of pushing for this global carbon price that you're talking about, what role could those play in Canada and are you seriously considering? We know, for example, that Canada produces some of the cleanest aluminum in the world. What, uh, what we're doing right now in different parts of the country uh, and what uh, we're innovating with Elisis, which is a, uh, a not just uh, energy but inputs and processes for net zero aluminum, is something that is extraordinarily valuable uh, to discerning consumers around the world. But we are right now competing with aluminum around the world that can be sold at even cheaper prices because it is done in dirtier ways with significantly lower labor standards. I don't think that's the kind of world we want where people who do the right things the right way get penalized and people who do wrong things the wrong way get advantages. So all we're looking at and what the conversations are all about right now, whether it's the uh, a global minimum standard for price on pollution or order adjustments or what have you, 
is a way of making sure a level playing field and that those who are stepping up and doing everything they can to reduce their emissions, to demonstrate new technologies that will be effective, are not penalized before they can even begin. On sait, par exemple, que l'aluminium fait au Canada, au Québec, et l'aluminium le plus propre au monde. Et une fois qu'on a la technologie Elysis, dans laquelle on est en train d'investir, ça va être encore plus. Mais, sur le marché mondial, cet aluminium canadien est en train de compétitionner avec de l'aluminium fait ailleurs, avec des processus plus nocifs pour l'environnement, avec des standards de travail plus bas, et, non, et donc nous sommes à un désavantage parce qu'on est en train de faire de meilleures choses pour l'environnement, pour les citoyens. Je pense que tout le monde peut comprendre qu'on a besoin d'avoir un système qui reconnaît et valorise le travail que font les pays, les compagnies, qui sont en train de faire des bonnes choses pour les bonnes raisons, et non les décourager en permettant à ceux qui ne sont pas en train de montrer du leadership en matière d'environnement de prendre des avantages. Donc, c'est ça, ces conversations que nous sommes en train d'avoir. Et il y a plusieurs mécanismes, que ce soit un, un, un standard minimum euh, pour une tarification du carbone, que ce soit des ajustements à la frontière. Il y a toutes sortes de façons de le faire et ces conversations continuent. Mais le principe s'entendre que ceux qui font les bonnes choses de la bonne façon devraient être reconnus et valorisés pour ce qu'ils sont en train de faire. Over the past number of days, I've had many, many interactions uh, with President Biden. Uh, one of them, the supply chain event in, uh, uh, at the G20 in Rome, uh, was specifically focused on uh, things uh, like the two issues you brought up. Uh, on critical minerals, for example, Canada and Australia, who are sitting beside me, uh, have uh, access to a large number of the uh, critical minerals that are needed in the production of batteries, in the production of uh, modern technologies. But again, the challenge is the extraction and the processing of those in our countries is more costly because we have higher environmental standards, higher labor standards than uh, the countries that are uh, right now busy cornering the market on uh, those sorts of productions. So the conversation we had is about, well, how much is it of value to developed countries to have a secure, friendly source of those critical minerals that are done in better and more responsible ways, even though, obviously, they may be a little more expensive. And having those conversations about, you know, it's worth it, particularly as we come through COVID, to make sure we have strong supply chains, so supply lines that are reliable and not subject to coercive practices or, uh, or manipulation. These are the conversations we're having. And on, on uh, the auto sector, the fact that Canada is as committed as we are to producing zero emission vehicles, uh, that we're already seeing changes in our auto industry, that our uh, auto industry is so tremendously um, interwoven with that of the United States and has been for 50 years uh, means that I know we're going to be able to work together to develop electric cars and to make sure that Canada as the number one export destination for cars made in the United States uh, continues to be able to work hand in hand uh, in our auto sector with the United States, including on electric vehicles. I'm Mr. Michael Couture of Global National. There's a high cost to coming to summits like this one considering all of the emissions, the carbon footprint, and the risk of COVID-19 for not only you, but your entire delegation. So, I was wondering, was it worth the lack of results that you're leading with today on climate action? I, I could totally disagree with the premise of your question. Uh, what we've actually seen today, whether it's